Let us pray. Lord, this morning we thank you. We thank you that we can be here, that we can leave our homes and enter our church without fear. James chapter 4, 17, 17 verses. Submit yourself to God. What causes fight and quarrels among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within you? You want something you don't get. You kill and covenant, but you cannot have what you want. You're, you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you asked, I do not receive because you asked and wrong motive for, with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hated towards God? Other, any, anyone who chooses to be a friend or, or who the world becomes enemy of God or do not think scriptures that reason with the Spirit. He causes to live in us, Yvonne's determined, but he gives us no, give us more grace. This is what scripture says. God opposes the, the proud and gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then, O God. Resist the devil and be, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Grief, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against your, his brother or judges him speaks against the law and the, judges it. When they judge the law, you are not keeping it. You're sitting in judgment on it. There is only one law-giving and judge, the one who is given, who is able to save and destroy, but you are to judge your neighbor, boasting about tomorrow. Now listen what you say to, today or tomorrow. You will go to this or that city, spend a year, then carry on business and money. Why, why you do not even know that will happen tomorrow? What is, what's in your life? You have missed and appeared to, appeared for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord will, you will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then, who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's lovely to have Rachel with us today. It is kind of them to give their time up for us. She loves coming here. Do you? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually, yes. <laughs> anyway, let's just pray for her. Father God, I just bring Rachel to you now. We do thank you, Lord, so much for the way she's coming and helping again. And I pray that the word you have given her to bring to us, that we receive it in the way that you want us to receive it, that we learn with it, we obey it, and we take it on board. So, Lord, just bring your spirit upon her now. Empower her and anoint her afresh. 
in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a real pleasure to be back with you this morning. Um, I was last here at the end of January, and uh, this is the third time I've been to Christchurch to come and speak. Um, and it always seems there's something significant happening when I'm here. Um, so the first time I came, um, I think it was, th it was the weekend that you announced that Glyn was going to be your vicar. The second time I came, Lee was leaving. And now the third time I'm coming, you've announced that you've got a, you know, another new vicar coming. So all I'm saying is maybe don't invite me back. <laughs> anyway, so uh, of course it's got nothing to do with me. I know that. But yes. anyway, um, so for those of you who don't know me all that well, um, I'm from Stopsy Baptist Church. Uh, I am one of the elders there, um, and I serve in various different capacities, um, including the worship team, and I uh, help to run a course that we have called Discover. Uh, we're currently actually in the middle of doing our Youth Discover course. We've got 20 young people who are taking part in that, which is really exciting. Um, doing Alpha, things like that. I'm in a, I'm in, uh, a small group that we call Beacons. Um, I'm helping to lead an 18 to 35 Bible study on a Sunday night. <laughs> Um, so I'm quite busy, <laughs> um, but uh, also outside of church, I'm a primary school teacher, which I've been doing for the last 16 years now, and I currently have year two, and uh, they're an absolute joy most of the time. Um, but one of, the, one of the roles that I have to take on as a teacher outside of just classroom teaching is um, you have you usually get given a subject that you have to lead. So uh, about... When I first went to the school that I'm currently at, I was asked to take on uh, music, and uh, because I sing and all this kind of thing, and um, so that was it was and it was and it was fine. It was absolutely fine. But I'll be honest to say that you know about three years ago, when that job got taken away from me, I wasn't really sorry. Um, somebody else took it over, and uh, I was <laughs> I was very relieved to kind of be able to pass it over. And then uh, last year, this this guy left, and they said, "Would you like to have it back?" And I was like. Oh. <laughs> Not really, but uh, I obviously I've ended up I've ended up back in that role again, and so part of that is that I um, I help to organise our choir, I help to um, I liaise with the Luton Lute Music Service and uh, and help to sort of oversee all of the music that goes on in the school, um, and uh, one of the events that we take our choir to is something called Young Voices. Um, which is at the O2 Arena. And uh, if you haven't ever come across this before, indulge me a little bit. I'm just going to explain what it is. Basically, it's the largest school choir in the world. So what they do is um, children from all over the UK, they uh, learn the same set of songs over about five or six month period. And, and then they get to go to these massive arenas around the country. So they, they do it in various different places, the O2 being one of them. And there's about somewhere between seven, 8,000 children in the choir, and they all sing together and uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a band, you know, live, live orchestra band, and, uh, and then they have uh, celebrities who come along and sing with them, and uh, it's, a, it's a really great night, and then the parents get to come and watch the concert in the evening, and they perform to about 20,000 people, and it's, it's a really fantastic experience for them. They absolutely love it. But I'm sure you can imagine for me, as the person who has to organise this and uh, get them in and get th getting out of the O2 arena is somewhat of a challenge when you've got so many other people trying to leave at the same time. And this year proved um, to be exactly the case because we had arranged with some of our parents who'd come to the concert that they could pick their children up just outside the main doors as we all came out. What we hadn't been told was that uh, security had been changed this year and they had a new pickup system. And uh, so when we got to the main gate, we could see all our parents, they were waiting there. And, and we're saying, right, okay, we're just gonna stop here, we're gonna stay here. And the security guards are going, no, you can't stand here, keep moving, keep moving. And we're like, but we, you know, we need to get over, no, you can't go over there, just keep going. And they forced us to go all the way around this massive, long, sort of circuitous route around the site. Um, and eventually we managed to get back to where we needed to be. And when you're in that kind of situation, it is incredibly stressful. Um, and you're and it's, it's very easy to think that the security team have got, you know, some kind of objective that they're, you know, deliberately trying to screw it up for you. And they're trying to make it difficult. But actually, you know, 
at the time, that's kind of how I felt. But when I was able to sit back and think about it, I thought, do you know what? They had a job to do. They had been given a specific set of instructions, and it's not their fault that it actually clashed with what I wanted to do. I had to see it objectively. And we're going to have a look in a little bit more detail at James chapter 4 this morning, because it is all about objectivity. And if you are familiar with the book of James, you'll know that it is all about living the Christian life before other people, in front of other people. Um, so it covers a whole range of um, you know, different areas of life, trials and temptations and listening and wisdom. The tongue is probably something we're very familiar with if you've ever read this book before. Talk, James talks about favoritism and, and don't, not doing that. Um, and when you get to chapter 4, he's, the tone actually changes. So up to this point, the, the first three chapters are very much kind of, He's, he's Pastor James. He's very, he's very pastoral. He's alongside people. He's trying to encourage them. There's this tone coming through. But when you get to chapter 4, he kind of changes into General James. And he begins to lay out a battle strategy for Christian living. And if you had to have a sort of a tagline or a, or a catchphrase that summed up this chapter, I would say it's know your enemy. This is what James is saying. He's saying, see this life objectively and recognize what is going on below the surface. And he kicks off with this right from the, right from the first verse because he says, what is it that's causing fights and quarrels among you? So he's writing to this church, a group of people who are clearly having issues. Um, but the question James is actually asking, he's not actually dealing with the actual issue. He's saying, what is really going on here? You know, don't look at this. Try not to look at this situation or these arguments that you're having through the subjectivity of hurt feelings. And I know that, you know, it's, it's far easier said than done. But stand back and try and analyze this situation. And James then goes on to outline three key enemies that are actually responsible for the problems that we face. And this is just as relevant to us now as 21st century church as it was to the people that James was writing to. So these three areas that he covers, in verses 1 to 3, he talks about our own desires. In verses 4 to 6, he talks about the world. And in verse 7, he talks about the devil. And we're going to take a little time to unpack each of those and think about how they impact us and what they may look like and how we overcome them. Because and this is one of the things I love about this book is because it's just so practical. It's so applicable. This is stuff that we can actually go and do tomorrow morning. This is not stuff that we, can, we just have to listen to on a Sunday morning and think, well, that was nice. It doesn't really have any impact in my life. This is stuff we can do tomorrow morning wherever we find ourselves. So the first, the first thing that James talks about is our own desires. Now, I think it's fair to say that this is a primary battle that we all face our own desires. I mean, this is at the root of sin, isn't it? If we're honest, we all just want our own way all the time. I know I do. Um, and Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good that I want to do. Oh, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. It's a very convoluted sentence. But you get the drift. He is struggling with the fact that he just can't seem to do what he's meant to be doing. And I'm sure that's a very common thing for all of us. I mean, it doesn't take me long to realize just how selfish I am. I only have to get behind the wheel of a car. Now, I'm not saying I've got road rage. I don't. But... You know, I often find myself thinking something rude about the person who wouldn't let me in or the person who didn't thank me. Oh, not th oh that's, that's the thing that really winds me up. When they don't thank you, you know, and you've sat there and you've waited for them to drive all the way past you and they just drive past and don't acknowledge it. I find myself doing that typically British kind of sarcastic thing under my breath. I'm like, all right, mate, thanks for that. You know, it's all right. But if I analyze... And if I analyze that and I see it for what it really is, actually, you know, the only reason that I'm cross is because 
actually, I wanted to be selfish. I wanted to be the one who went first. I wanted to be acknowledged, or actually, I wanted to have it all my own way. That's really where it's coming from. And the example that James uses is, he relates it to coveting in verse 2. Now, that may not be a word that is all that common, that we don't tend to use it much these days. Um, But the emotion that lies behind coveting is very common. It's envy. And, you know, it's that moment where, you know, I want what they have, and I want it right now. You know, Lord, it's that toddler temper tantrum that we can all have sometimes. And one of the ways that it shows up in our lives is when, have you ever had that situation, you know, where someone comes to you and they tell you something really exciting that's happened in their life, or they share a really great story with you, and while you're listening to this story, you're immediately thinking of something that has happened to you that's along the same kind of lines, or it's actually, it just tops their story just that little bit more, and you can't wait for them to shut up because you want to tell your story. Okay, that is, what env- that is one of the ways that envy shows up because what it's doing is it's taking the glory from someone else. You know, if we're not going to be envious, it's about allowing the glory of the moment to rest with that person and not take it from them. And James says that is what happens unless we train ourselves to see things differently and to recognize our own shortcomings one of the things that will happen is that this coveting, this envy, will turn up in our prayer life. So, you know, it's important for us to know what does that look like and why is it important to recognize? Well, quite simply, the impact of envy will be that we become dissatisfied with God because we can't wait with patience and trust. He isn't doing it to my timetable. He isn't doing this fast enough. Issues with trust always come down to timing. Someone said to me yesterday, you know, God's got all the time in the world. We just don't think we have. That's the problem. You know, and our motivation behind our prayers will then turn into worry and anxiety rather than faith and trust. And uh, for me, I think the way that I found that the answer to this is through daily training in God's gym. I've, re- I've, I've, go to the, I've, you know, I've started going to the gym in the last couple of years. Um, I'll be honest, you know, and say, you know, it's, I still don't like it <laughs> all that much. It's still a little bit of an effort to get myself to go. But I do it because I know it's good for me. And in God's gym, it looks slightly different. The areas are word. Are you spending time in God's word? Are you actually spending, a, you know, a, a part of every day? studying it and looking at it and learning from it. Worship. Do you spend time worshiping God outside of corporate worship? You know, do you, do, it, do you sing in the car? Do you sing in the shower? Do you listen to something, you know, when you've got your own time to, you know, to spend time just worshiping God or just going on a walk and going out and looking, wow, you're amazing, God. Look at what you've done. This is, this is incredible. I mean, today is a perfect day for that. So if you've got nothing to do this afternoon, I'd highly recommend it. What about prayer? What's your prayer life looking like? You know, for me, that was probably one of the areas that I really struggled with. I mean, I, I don't have so much of an issue around reading the Bible because I actually quite enjoy it. And I, you know, it's, it's something that I, I really value. But prayer, I've always found a real struggle. You know, it, it felt a bit like, initially, it felt a bit like talking to the ceiling. And I was like, oh, you know, it's a bit of a drag. It's something I've got to do. But one of the ways that I've overcome that for me personally is that in the last seven months, I think it is, I've, um, I've started meeting as part of a prayer triplet with two ladies at my church. And we meet on a weekly basis. Um, in fact, we met last night, actually. And, uh, you know, and we, we just share what's going on. And, you know, God has proved to me through that process that he... He's just incredible when it comes to answering prayer. I have seen so many answers to prayer in the, in the, since we've started meeting. It has completely revolutionized how I view prayer and the role that it plays in my life. And I think the fourth area that God, you know, that we can work on is about church family. 
you know, are we meeting regularly together? Are we being part of that? Are we involved? Are we, you know, committed to one another outside of just being here on a Sunday morning? You know, that, what does that look like? You know, all of those different areas, word, worship, prayer, church, family, they all strengthen the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And they enable him to make us more Christ-like. Because ultimately, that is what the goal is, isn't it? That is, that's what we're aiming for. To be, to be more and more like Jesus. So which muscles do you need to work on? Have a think about it. Yeah, that's something between you and God. But James goes on to say that the second area, the second enemy, rather, that we face in our Christian walk is the world. Now, James is talking about society and culture. He is not talking about... Uh, you know, selling all your possessions, going to live on a mountaintop and waiting out till Jesus comes back. That's not what he's going on about. Neither is James saying that we can no longer be friends with non-Christians. Because, I mean, how on earth are they going to hear about Jesus if we stop spending time with them? I mean, that, that just isn't, isn't, doesn't make any sense at all. But there is a really important decision to make. And James says that we have to choose between friendship with society and culture or friendship with God. Because these two are like oil and water. They simply don't mix. And I see it all the time at school. Um, you know, there are, you know, you get a new child who joins the class and, uh, you know, initially every child wants to be their friend. You know, that's how it works. They're all crowd around them and they're all desperate to be the next best buddy. Um, but eventually what happens is you start seeing them gravitating towards a particular person. And it's usually the person you really don't want them to do that with. <laughs> um, and you're just thinking, oh, no, I can see that going badly wrong. That's, re that's really not a good combination. But there's not much you can do about it. But what tends to happen in a friendship like that is one influences the other. And when they get themselves into trouble, the conversation always goes the same way. He made me do it. She, it was her idea. It wasn't me. It's always that excuse that comes up every single time. And I think that is what James is talking about when he says that we have to choose between friendship with the world and friendship with God. Because otherwise you end up with exactly the same conversation that Adam and Eve had with God in, in Eden. It wasn't my fault. She made me do it. It wasn't my fault, God, that I, I decided to do that. It was their idea. You know, it was them. It wasn't me. In Matthew 6, Jesus says that where your heart is, your treasure will be also. And I would argue that the same could be applied when we say, actually, do you know, where your heart is, your character will be also. Because James actually uses an incredibly strong word in verse 4. He says, he actually refers to the people he's writing to as adulterous. I mean, adultery is a really strong word. You know, it's, it's about the breaking of a lifelong commitment in a relationship with another person. You know, if you have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, then it's like a wedding vow. You are held to that promise, and with it comes a certain set of expectations about how we think, how we act, how we talk. And several times throughout Scripture, God refers to himself as a jealous God. You know, that means he doesn't share you. He doesn't share you at all. How you live, how you spend your money, how you spend your time, your resources, they all matter to him. Every single one of those areas. And he wants a say in it. He wants a partnership with you. you know, one of my... Um, one of my favorite verses in scripture is Psalm um, 19, verse 14. And it says, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And it's something that I often pray because I think to myself, do you know, Lord, I, I pray that what I say, how I think, how I act is going to please you, Jesus, because you're my protector, you're my stability, and you paid an incredibly high price to save me. So I want to set you... A little challenge this morning. On the surface, it could seem quite simple, but I don't actually think it is. When you get home, take a bit of time to analyze how you spend your time. 
What do you listen to? Do you have a playlist? What's on it? What do you read? What films do you watch? What do you look at online? If you have social media, what do you post? What do you share? And does it fit with the verse that Anne read to us this morning from Philippians 4? Paul said, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about or focus on those things. That's Paul's advice. Is it because God is a spoil sport that he insists on this kind of life? No, of course not. It's because he loves us, but he also wants us to shine. And I don't know what you think, but I think the world is a dark enough place without those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior dimming their own lights. We need to be making ourselves shine. You know, over the last few months, I've been um, doing a bit of study in the book of Psalms. And uh, when I got to Psalm 69, um, I was listening to a commentary on it. And the guy who was, who was doing the commentary was saying how it was a prophecy of the cross. And it struck me anew as I read it, just how much Jesus has actually done for me. You know, he was whipped until his skin was shredded to ribbons. He suffered catastrophic blood loss. The wood of the cross would have rubbed against those open wounds as he tried to breathe, and there were nails hammered through his wrists and his ankles. Now, the Bible says that he was unrecognizable as a man by the time the Romans had finished with him. But on top of all of the physical suffering came that alien sensation of having sinned, and yet he hadn't. I mean, I know how awful I feel when I know that I've disappointed God when I've done something, and I can sense a separation in our relationship. But, you know, I know I can go to God and I can ask for forgiveness, and it all goes away. I mean, just imagine having that physical agony and then drowning in the sewage of human wickedness from every century gone and every century yet to come and not being able to escape it. There was no forgiveness that day. God's fury at sin was poured out on himself. And it was because of all of that, I look at that and I think that is why I choose to live a life that honors Jesus. I may not get it right all of the time and quite often I don't, but The cross gives me fresh motivation every time, as should it for all of us. But of course, in verses 11 and 12, James then reminds us not to judge one another. You know, I mean, you may be feeling a little bit judged right now. That's not my intention. You know, telling you how to live your life. But there is a huge difference between feeling judged, which is, I think, a conviction of the Holy Spirit, And actually being so, which often turns up as slander and gossip. And I've actually recently realized that despite my best intentions, um, you know, I've always tried to, I've always tried to be the the one, you know, at work who doesn't really want to listen to sort of stories about other people or, or I, or I try to diffuse it if, if I hear other people saying something unkind. But I've realized actually that I am just as guilty about you know, slandering other people or gossiping about them. But up until this point, I've managed to justify it because I dress it up about um, as to how I'm feeling about a particular situation. And that's how I've managed to get away with it, at least up until now. And I've, I've just recently realized that, and I thought, you know what? It's a bit of a shock when you, you find out something about yourself that you don't actually like all that much. <laughs> um, you know, and I thought, no, that needs to go. That is, that's something that, you know... Jesus, you and I need to work on in me, and I need you to just chip that away. So, you know, if I do come back, you can ask me. (laughs) Um, But if I were to go around saying, you know, or so-and-so, they can't possibly be a good Christian because of whatever it is that they're doing, that's the kind of judgment that James is referring to here. You know, making rude assumptions about somebody else because of something that I see in their life. I mean, how can I possibly know that? I can't. I can't possibly, I can't know what their prayer life is like or the state of their relationship with God because 
you know, I have absolutely no idea how big an issue that particular thing is for them in their life. Or how, just how far they've already come in, in overcoming that. I've got absolutely no right to stand there in judgment and say, kind of, say things about, usually about them rather than to their face. But does that mean then that we can't challenge in love? No, I don't think it does. I think, you know, in verse 6, God says he opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. You know, I think that if you need to challenge a Christian brother or sister about something in their life that you can see that doesn't match it up with Scripture, then I think it's right to go and do that. But, there's a big but here, comes with a couple of caveats. First one is that only should we do that after we've prayed and asking God whether or not you actually should say anything. And be willing to obey either way. If God comes back to you and he says, no, keep your mouth shut, then do it. If God comes back to you and he says, no, it's okay to go and say something, have the guts to go and say something. Either way, it's not actually that easy. But the second thing I think is just really important is that if God says, gives you the green light to go and speak to somebody about something, then have the courtesy to do it one-to-one. Do it face-to-face and do it with love and compassion. Don't do it via text, email, or any other written form of communication. Because you can't hear the tone of voice that somebody intended to write that with. And no matter, how, what, no matter what you meant when you wrote that down, it's left open to interpretation. And it's usually interpreted by the person who receives it and is hurt by it. And that is how they're going to see it. But if we then do all of that, if we do it one-to-one, we do it face-to-face, we do it compassionately, how that person responds isn't actually, if we've done it the right way, isn't actually our, I'm not saying it isn't our concern, because that makes makes me sound callous. But what I mean is that if you've been obedient to what God has asked you to do, then actually it's up to, we submit the rest to God and we ask him to deal with, or hopefully that person is going to go to him and get that sorted out between him and them. Because James says in verse 7 that when we submit to God, the outcome is that Satan has to run from us. And that brings us to the third enemy, the big one, that James refers to in this chapter, and that is the devil. Now, not a topic that many church services cover. Can't say I've heard many. But, you know, Christians on the whole tend to either fear him or ignore him, mostly. Um, And to be honest, both are pretty good positions for him because both end up paralyzing us, which is what he wants. They strip us of our inheritance and our identity in Christ, either because we're afraid of what might happen or because Actually, we don't really care. But what if we saw ourselves for who we really are? What if we recognized ourselves as children of the living God and as a soldier of Christ? Then we could take a stand. James says that we should resist. He's actually using a military term here. And we could say to Satan the same thing that David said to Goliath. You, know, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he is going to give you into my hands. And we could say, you know, I come against you, Satan, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth who defeated you at the cross, so you better start running, because I'm coming for you. That's who we are. That's who we, that's the, that's what we've been given in Jesus, that authority. It's important that we recognize who we are and the powerful weapons that we've been given in Jesus. You know, don't just stand on the battlefield wearing your armor and not fighting back. There is absolutely no justification for pacifism in this war. There is too much at stake. There are souls at stake. 
And we have a responsibility to be telling people exactly what Jesus can do for them. But of course, you know, it's easy to go from one extreme to another. It's easy to become so puffed up about who we are in Christ that we actually forget it's about Jesus and not our own abilities. That somehow beating the devil, the world, and our own desires was done by us. Which is why James finishes with the key to the whole thing. And he talks about humility. He says, we're called to be soldiers, but we are soldiers who are on their knees. And recognizing that how you fight is just as important as who you're fighting. If we believe our own hype, we are going to fall flat on our faces. James reminds us that in all of the elements he has outlined so far, that it is vital to remain objective, to see things as they really are, and not rushing ahead of God, because we think, now that we know who we are in Christ, and what weapons we have available to us, that somehow we no longer need to invite God into this situation, or into the conversation. James makes it very clear that the Christian life is designed to be a partnership with God. But make no mistake, this is not an equal partnership. Because this is a partnership that requires that we die to ourselves. And the example that James uses about is, um, is found in verses 13 to, the, to 17, where he, he writes about this idea of making grand plans without God's say-so. Somebody who's boasting about what they're going to do, even though they have absolutely no idea how life is going to turn out for them. And I actually had an experience of this earlier this year. Um, I've, got a, I've got a very good friend. Actually, one of the ladies who's in my prayer triplet is, um, part, is a chair of trustees of a charity called Malawi Orphan Fund. And they help to um, run a children's home out in Malawi called Home of Hope. And uh, she's, she's talked about this so many times. And I've, I've just been a little bit kind of like inspired by it. And I, I said to her, next time you go, can I come with you? I'd really love to see what you're doing out there. And she was like, yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really good. So we started planning um, to go in July this year. And, uh, and then I thought to myself, well, on the back of that, actually, since I'm in that vicinity in the world, my best friends actually live in Cape Town. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. On the back of that time in Malawi, I'll, you know, we'll go our separate ways in, in Johannesburg and I'll go to Cape Town. She can come home to the UK and I'll spend some time with my friends. And, uh, you know, the one thing I never did actually, was ask God whether or not he even wanted me to do this. I just assumed, because it was something I'd done before. I just thought, yeah, okay, we'll just go ahead and do this. We'll plan this. This is, this is great. Well, about three months ago, um, I was having a... J Jane, my friend, who's um, part of this charity, she came back to me and she said, I'm really sorry, but this, this isn't going to work. We've just had a trustees meeting, and there are actually quite a lot of groups who are going out to Malawi at the same time that we were planning to go. So unfortunately, it isn't going to be possible can you go in October half term? I was like, uh, no, no, I can't. I can't do that. Um, so, so oh, well, maybe it's not going to work out this time. I, saw, so I was like, okay, fair enough. Okay, we'll, we'll leave it for another time. Within 10 minutes, I had a text from my friend in Cape Town to say that uh, she wasn't sure it was going to work, me coming out to visit her. And, uh, and then when we had a conversation, because she's now, she's also a teacher, she's now working full time. And it turned out that their school holidays were completely different from the UK school holidays, down to the point where it was like the day that I broke up from school was the day she was going back. It was, it was just, it just was not going to work. So I kind of came downstairs and I thought, you know what, I've never actually asked you, God, whether you even wanted me to do this. I, maybe, maybe you don't. Is, 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 maybe, ooh, okay. So I actually, I said, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, is, do you, what, what do you want me to do? And I, I felt like the Holy Spirit, he just said, Rachel, I want you to stay here this summer. You've got to stay in the UK. I have absolutely no idea why God wants me to stay here this summer. Um, other than the one thing that has happened is that I've been invited to speak at our youth camp um, this summer. So maybe... Who knows? Who knows what God wants me to do there? I have absolutely no idea. Very exciting, though. But, you know, keeping close to God, walking with Jesus daily, dying to self, humility is what's required if we're going to get this right. You know, people often see humility as weak. It's not. True humility requires a tremendous amount of courage, actually. First, to recognize that you don't have all of the answers. And secondly, to be willing to submit your will 
under God's. And finally, to be obedient to whatever it is he asks you to do. That's quite often the hardest bit. Because, you know, it, it, sometimes God asks you to do some very odd things. And you don't know why. And he won't tell you why. That's the other thing. You just have to go. But it's always going to be the most rewarding because blessing follows obedience. I think that what James highlights in this chapter in many ways is quite obvious. You know, the Christian life may not be easy, but it's not impossible. If we do it God's way. God's way invites us to see things for what they really are to know our enemy, to know who you are as God's child, and to cultivate humility. I think we'll have to be going on. Should we pray? Father God, I just want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you that you have given us a part of your word that is just so practical and it is so full of advice that is easy, well, I say easy to put into practice, but it, it's possible to put into practice if we're willing to go the distance. And I just pray for each one of us here that we would be willing to submit ourselves under your will. Whatever that looks like in our lives, wherever we find ourselves tomorrow morning, I pray that we would have the humility to recognize that even when something seems a little bit odd or perhaps you, we, we're sensing you're asking us to do something that's outside of our comfort zone, that actually you have a reason for doing that and that our job is to obey and to do what you ask of us. So I thank you, Jesus. I thank you that we are your children. I thank you that we have authority in your name and that you have already won the way for us. Thank you in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.